Okay. Can you hear me now? Rasmus? Yes, yes, yes. I muted myself, but yes. Okay. So, Harold Martens is my name. I was a colleague of Rasmus for some years in the 90s, end of the 90s, and we have known each other much longer than that. And he has asked me to give a seminar, and I have uh, said that I would like to talk about interpretable machine learning with an eye for the physics, that is hybrid analysis and modeling of multi multivariate or multi-channel data. I'm a biochemist by training. I hated mathematics all through my studies, but then I have had 50 years with mathematics and statistics and data modeling. And uh, I became a professor at the uh, Department of Engineering Cybernetics after I had retired a couple of other a couple of times already and I founded a company Idletex. I'll come back to what we are doing in this. So generally speaking, society, at least in the Western countries, has an enormous math gap between the house of math and the house of everything else. And very few people are willing and able to balance take the balancing act of going back and forth between the two worlds. And then for some years, people thought that they could bridge the gap by putting in their black box with AI in. And I think that's, um, it, it is wonderful, some of the things that people have been able to do in AI, but for technical data that I work with, I don't think it is necessary and I don't think it is very fruitful. So what I will talk about is a two way bridge between the two worlds based on what I again call interpretable machine learning with an eye for the physics. Modern multivariate measurements like um, thermal video looking into a, a metallurgical uh, furnace process or something generate enormous amounts of high quality data. The question is how to interpret this data. Uh, our institute our, our university just shot up our first research satellite uh, with a hyperspectral camera, a homemade uh, out of, uh, hyperspectral camera, and it's working fine. It went up a couple of weeks ago, and now we are getting data very nicely. And uh, that is going to generate enormous amounts of, uh, of uh, spectral data. Um, we have uh, companies running high end hyperspectral cameras for landscape uh, monitoring, for environmental monitoring, for remote sensing video, because they repeatedly visit the same area. And the question is how then to analyze these data. So they certainly deliver big data, lots of pixels. Let's say a, a thermal camera has 500 thermometers in parallel and gives data, high quality data every second. But the reality that we're looking at does not have the kind of complexity uh, that, for instance, language tradition, uh, translation requires or certain medical applications and so on. So even though technical measurements give big data, it's kind of overkill to use artificial neural nets or convolutional neural nets. But the question is, what should we do instead? Because there are problems with ANN and CNN. This lecture is not about that, but we can have a fight about that some other time. People close their eyes and hold their nose and push a button and try to think that they get something with the black box modeling tool, and they certainly do. But you build an intellectual debt. Uh, you owe the world an understanding, but sooner or later that debt has to be paid back. Black box is very, very dangerous when nobody understands what's going on. Anyway, so what I'm going to talk about is the uh, merger between geometrics and cybernetics in what we call big data cybernetics at our institute. And um, for instance, for the, for the um, industrial process monitoring with a thermal video camera, we can pull out very compact representations of what's going on. And um, for hyperspectral imaging from space or from an airplane, we can, for instance, do things like removing shadows spectrally. And I'll go more, a little bit more into this. I'll focus on the hyperspectral camera applications and related issues. But basically, I work more with thermal camera uh, 
than with, and my colleagues in Agitex work more with thermal camera. But since we have this satellite also coming now with lots of data, and uh, then I uh, focus on that. So hyperspectral environmental remote sensing camera uh, mounted in a small airplane is being used routinely to monitor um, the hyperspectrally. Each pixel has several hundred wavelengths of light. And, and uh, you can see a lot of details here. And the question then is how to do that, how to analyze them. These hundreds of wavelengths of light in a high, dense, high, high resolution picture, we can just symbolize as big data measured. Now, when we get these data, we have a very limited understanding of what is going on here, but we do have a purpose. And our limited understanding concerns the equations for the physical laws, for instance, for, for how, what, what, how does it feel to be a photon out in the world? And also we have spectra of expected constituents like chlorophyll and water and things like that. But it's still limited because there are a number of things we don't know. Still, based on the limited understanding, we can make a theory-driven multivariate pre-processing where we model the knowns. And if, we, if the knowns are also differential equations or finite element models, we can make so-called multivariate meta-models and get them to uh, in the same format as empirical data. So we can model the knowns and we get out the model parameters and so on. And we get, yeah. Sorry, uh, your master is showing slides. Right, so my point was that I'm talking about interpretable, interpretable machine learning with an eye for the physics. And we have this math gap between the house of math and house of everything else. And I personally at least don't like to try to fill that gap with a black box because it will sooner or later we have to pay back um, what for not having an understanding. Uh, I want to make a two-way bridge between the two worlds of math and the house of everything else. And a thermal camera in the industry gives a lot of data. Our new satellite from our institute with our homemade hyperspectral camera gives a lot of data. And when we do um, uh, hyperspectral imaging from an airplane, um, uh, we see that uh, works. And, and uh, the question is how it should work. How can we combine metrics and control theory, for instance? I'm at the Institute for Control Theory. I'm a, the only one there who is not particularly good in control theory. I'm a biochemist, but it's a lot of fun and I'm learning. So what I'm talking about today is not so much what we do with the thermal videos uh, in industry, not today, but I will talk more about what we do with the hyperspectral cameras in the industry. So this is approximately where I was. We want to categorize the growth on the ground with an airplane with a hyperspectral camera. The airplane moves along every so often and we get, we can align them into a, a movie in a way with a lot of channels. Hera? Yeah. So sorry. Yes. Full screen. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. And um, the enormous amounts of raw data we can see as big data measured. Our limited understanding uh, allows us to combine the measurements with what we knew before about the physical equations, the laws of how does it feel to be a photon and how does the, what does water mean and what's the geometry for shadows and things like that. And we can have spectra of unexpected uh, or expected constituents like chlorophyll and water and house paint and whatever. So this means that we can do theory-driven multivariate pre-processing of the big data coming in. We model the knowns and we get model states, modeled states, known states, and then we get lack of fit. This peak here was not picked up by our theory. And we let that be input to the modeling of the unknowns by data-driven multivariate modeling of the residuals. So that gives us a model of the, the unexpected but, but uh, clear unknowns. And we get a lack of fit residuals after that. And that we can put into traditional machine learning to look for whether there is something more in the noise. Let's say we can say we can sweep the floor 
just look if there is anything funny. And maybe there is, we find something funny a little bit. And then we have the final noise level that we can feed back and optimize the least, weighted least squares modeling. The point is that each of these outputs are very low dimensional because even though a camera maybe have a half a million pixels and then a hundred channels, it doesn't have, the reality doesn't have 500,000 times 100 different causality types. So we get an, a, a description of the physical and chemical knowns and unknowns, and maybe some funny things in the end. And we can, we can interpret these things, realign them, Met, make, get a better understanding and get a better solution to our purpose and replace the limited understanding. So it's a part of a cyclic learning process of science, but also engineering wise, it gives us better control of what's going on. So let me start by looking at the theory driven, the multivariate pre-processing, modeling the knowns. Let's start with this uh, thing. How do I remove shadows? Um, the hyperspectral imaging is more informative than RGB. You know, the RGB, the three channel RGB cameras, they are just sensitive to the more or less the same freak wavelengths as a human eye. And that's very boring, in my opinion. But if we have a hyperspectral camera or a spectrophotometer, we have many, many different uh, channels of light in the visible or in IR or combination. For instance, water here. Here we see the transmitted water uh, spectrum of, of a lot of water temperature, uh, water samples at different temperatures, for instance. And that gives a lot more information. Many of you know these things better than I do. But anyway, so we take the plane and we um, have a high resolution image and we take out and amplify, for instance, a special part of it. And you see there's a problem. Um, the shadows, the shadows here, uh, they often have to be thrown away, the pixels in the shadows, because they behave so differently from the other shadows or other pixels. So state of the art is often today to throw the pixels away that are in shadows behind trees, for instance, or behind a mountain or behind a house or whatever. So instead, the solution that we propose and we have worked with for some years now, multivariate spectral de-shadowing. We make a hybrid model where we say that the, based on our limited understanding, the spectral absorbance of the observed data is really uh, the sum of some spectrum of what's going on on the ground, then an illumination spectrum. They are additive in log terms. They are multiplicative in the intensity curve. So we work with Norwegian Bioscience University on this and a couple of companies, other companies. And, and that you can see here that we are, it's not perfect, but you certainly can see a lot more of the yellow stripes on the road than you can see here, for instance. This information is, of course, embedded here. But it, so the de-shadowing is not strictly necessary, but it makes life much easier. That's just a little illustration of what can be done. Something more serious is the uh, separation of physics and chemistry in spectral data. So here, for instance, we have um, different types of minerals, uh, five different types of minerals and a number of of pixels in a hyperspectral image <clears throat> of samples of each of them. And you can, you can very clearly see variations in light scattering here. So our theory about light scattering, we implement in the EMSC pre-processing. And then the theory about baselines, how that vary uh, with shape, we can embed in a baseline correction model. And that gives us semi-causal models of light scattering and baseline variations. And applying that to these data, the data look like this. So this makes life much, much easier when you have transformed the measurements into this domain. This may tempt people to use neural nets and so on, but 
when you see this, any chem first year student in chemistry can say that you don't need a neural net for this. Because in fact, the way the photon, how does it feel to be a photon in real life? It's very systematic at least. Maybe we don't understand everything, but it is very systematic and we can find out. So now we have looked at the modeling of known phenomena by deshadowing and by separating physics from chemistry. Now let's look at the unknown phenomenon, the autoencoding for interpretable data compression. So we take the, the unmodeled residual from the theory-driven modeling and put that into a data-driven model of big data residuals to model the unknowns and we to get out the unmodeled unknowns, the modeled unknowns. So many of you have seen this data set that was the last data set that I ever measured at the University of Copenhagen, together with Jesper Palm in the spectrophotometer that I was part in designing from Takeda in the early 80s, actually. There's an near infrared. And these are mixtures of five different uh, uh, types of wheat simulated or reconstructed wheat flowers, mixtures of starch and protein. And you're one, two, three, four, five. And when we try to get the best univariate calibration for protein content, of course, you see that you see why we do chemometrics and multivariate calibration, because there's no single wavelength that correlates to protein content. But when we mean center, then use a PLS regression, for instance, then we can have a purely empirical mathematic model that does a reasonable job in predicting the protein content in this. And of course, that's why this instrument is sold all over the world, I think, even today, I think. And of course, our book from 89 describes this uh, in detail. But if we instead go for a semi-causal mathematical model, the optimized EMSE, then the data look like that. It's the same data. There are 100, 100 frames here. And of course, then the, the, it's so much easier to make a calibration model. You don't need a PLS at all because you can use any wavelength. So the question is, how is that done? So let's go through the, through the steps here. Um, part of my screen is covered by the, by the menu from Zoom. I don't know if you see it, but anyway, let's, let's start with the raw data up to the left, which didn't work very well, no matter which single wavelengths I was using. But the PLS regression or ridge regression or many other methods, reduced rank methods, principal component regression would give me a, some kind of a regression spectrum that I could multiply with this data and then get out the predicted protein content. Then we can see how the multivariate calibration works and we can see what the calibration gives for in this case for protein quant uh, quantification. And we can see why, start to see at least why the multivariate calibration works. We have <clears throat> the two main principal components or PLS components, the red and the blue are two spectral features of variation. And we can plot them against each other and see the score plot. Loading, no, loadings and score plot, very conventional chemometrics. But in this case, we took that information and uh, now we want to go into the uh, results from the data-driven model <coughs> and see if we can make better theory and come back up. And this is, I'm very critical, negative in a way, to my own 50 years in geometrics in this, I'm, I'm very happy I've had a good life, but I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't eager enough to do this feedback here. I wasn't eager enough to try to formulate mechanistic models of my understanding. So this is one of the things I would like to recommend to you. Try to develop mechanistic models when, if you can. And in this case, the five different mixture ratios between protein and starch, <clears throat> ranging from pro zero to 100% protein, they formed straight lines. 
meeting at a point of just a flat baseline. So the loadings themselves were not very easy to, to interpret. But the fact that they formed straight lines and met at a point, and the point was flat, <coughs> what was that? So we started to think about how does it feel to be a photon in powder? And we formulated an optimized EMSC model based on the bare lambda's law, combining the traditional EMSC with a simplex optimization of a given parameter set. And so, uh, based on this, we could re reconstruct these original input data <laughs> if we only looked, if we want to, only wanted to to rely on the chemistry in the data, the reconstruction is like to lower left. Or if we wanted to include both the chemistry and the physics, both the chemistry, which is the absorbance, and the physics, which is the light scattering, because both carry information, but very type of different types of information. And if you want to utilize both, then uh, the data will look like this. Without, they look like that. And anyway, in both cases, we got a better insight. And we could use this now for modeling. And in, I, in both cases, the calibrations look like that. So this is the, the, what I'm insisting on. If people want to work with neural nets and so on, which I can see it's um, not only hyped. I mean, these methods are good if you take the experimental design seriously and, and, and try to understand what's going on. And they are very good methods. It's just that that's very hard work, contrary to what is explained. But if you do that, then you can see that it, not only neural nets are lacking the score plot, but also traditional statistical methods like rich regression and so on elastic nets and so on. Statisticians don't give it, and the machine learning people don't give it. This low dimensional subspace of the relevant as essence of the content of the data. Uh, they only give regression coefficients. And the, from a causal point of view, it's absolutely meaningless. It's very misleading. But if you look in the score plot, then you can see, start thinking, what's going on here? This is a diplomacy machine because many people can look at the same plot and you can fight it out and come to an, uh, some hypothesis. And then, of course, we have to test these hypotheses. So this is an example of explainable AI in science and technology of the type that we are doing in the idle text. Now, let me give a more detailed uh, example, uh, namely hyperspectral NIR video of drying wood. Now we start talking about serious amounts of data. <clears throat> you know, wet wood is, is dark and dry wood is much lighter. So this is actually a, a piece of Norwegian spruce that was, <clears throat> first it was dried thoroughly, and then it was uh, sub submerged in water for 24 hours or something. And then it was scanned, was put on a translation stage on a weight the scale to carry to look at the water con how that water content changes that's not as essential here but it has a translation stage this moving back and forth and it's a push broom camera making a hyperspectral scan of one line of pixels and the other one direction is the, the wavelength and so by moving it you get 2d images so this is how it looked when we take this several hundred wavelengths of light and just pick out the things that relate to the RGB wavelengths. And it looks like this for wet. And after 24 hours, 21 hours of drying, it looks like that. That's the raw data, you might say. So <clears throat> within this concept of uh, uh, hyperspectral NIR video, <clears throat> first we'll make a <coughs> hybrid model of known and unknown variation types in combination. First, we take the, oh, first we take, um, uh, the uh, hyperspectral data, big data, and we project it on an EMSC model of 
an average wind spectrum, some, uh, some simple light scattering baseline variables, uh, the typical brown color of wood, and a typical water spectrum. Based on our limited understanding, each pixel here is projected on those in a knowledge base driven modeling. And so we get out uh, scores for each of these five spectral parameters. One, two, three, four, five. One, the first one showing the path length, and then some offset and slope and uh, <clears throat> different uh, chemical composition and different water composition. And we could also take the average per image for the for the um, for the different one, two, three, four, five. We get the time series of that, and based on that, we could even then make um, ordinary partial differential equation kinetic models <clears throat> of the drying process for the known phenom phenomena. But then there are residuals because this is by no means a perfect model. So now we want to model the unknown. So we take the residuals into a data-driven modeling of the type that Chemometrics is very good. We learned it from the psychometricians. I studied psychometrics at Bell Labs uh, before Chemometrics was invented, even the term invented, I think. But uh, I didn't know that there was such a thing as Chemometrics, but I learned it from psychologists, how to do PCA and, and a parafuck and so on canonical decomposition, they call it. Um, and, and that gives us now loading spectra. In contrast to the known stages where we define the loading spectra and push that to a data, here the data push their loading, residual loading spectra to us. And we get, of course, the spatial and temporal uh, scores. And then uh, we can plot the scores and look for patterns. And we can get make differential equations or kinetics of these unexpected phenomena as well as the expected phenomena up here. So now we have a lot better mechanistic understanding of what we had. So that understanding now brings us <coughs> to a, we can make a better theory-driven model. We need, ideally, the three types of outputs should be reorganized because there are some alias problems when you do it sequen sequentially, but that can be cleaned up as a, as, as a, in a, pre, a post processing stage. But the point is, at least in this case, that we could use sweep the floor with traditional machine learning, but there was no need because we had 99.8% explained variance or something. So we just dropped the machine learning. This was good enough with the theory-driven and the data-driven models of the spectroscopy. And I've seen that many, many times that we can get <laughs> extremely good fit with these type two types of model stages. And that's because we know pretty well, how does it feel to be a photon? So we are into this hyperspectral video NIR video of drying wood. Now let's look at the so-called idle model of motion and light changes. This is a very important aspect of this interpretive machine learning with an eye for the physics. First of all, you know, anybody who has built a house or put at least the lead floor, the wooden floors, know that if the wood is wet or moist, and if you nail it, nail the, the, the floor cover firmly, then it will um, shrink and have a lot of cracks. You wake up the next morning and the floor is full of cracks. So that's why you, you uh, lay the floor, don't nail it down, let it shrink, and then it will shrink towards the middle of the room and you can then do some funny things along the edges to fill in the gaps and put on a, <clears throat> a way to hide the cracks that have then occurred. So in this case here, the question is that <clears throat> wet, when wet wood is drying, it changes the water content, that's chemistry, the whiteness, that's physics, but also the size and shape. So uh, the the uh, exaggerating a little bit here, the dry wood is smaller 
than the wet wood when it is the same piece of wood. So we choose uh, for the setting of the instrument, we choose the in image uh, for the uh, um, dry wood as a reference method, reference image, because there we see most of the wood. If we had taken that size for the wet wood, there would be edges, edge information that would be outside the frame of the image. So this is a paper that came out a couple of weeks ago, hyperspectral video analysis by motion and intensity pre-processing and subspace autoencoding. This is Rafa Vitale, many of you know him, Cyril Wackebusch, you know him, uh, Ingen Burud, at the, uh, she's an astrophysicist and, and me being a, I don't know what, it, what I am these days, biochemist, I suppose. I'm still waiting to become a chemist, but maybe 50 years too late, I don't know. Anyway, so the motion for displacing, displacement of the shrinking wood calls for idle modeling. So idle modeling, what is that? Jeez. How can I organize this? So idle modeling of intensity and shape changes. The, the intensity image, hyperspectral intensity image, at time t, we say is a function of an, a reference image. And here's, let's say we take the last image, the, the driest image as a reference image. And uh, then we assume that it is, you know, it, we know that it is the same piece of wood at all times during the process of drying. So we go backwards in time from the last reference image. And we say there is a change in intensity and that is about the loss of water <clears throat> primarily, but also the loss or, or, or the loss of light scattering. Both of them give change in the intensity. And uh, the reference plus the change in intensity, we just call L for a local description of wood absorbances. While D is then the displacement or change of wood shape at time D, T. And then we let E be the error, unmodeled noise and other types of error. And so the model is IT, intensity at time T, is a displacement model of a localized intensity model plus error. So you see, uh, we when this chemistry and physics is what we did with these minerals and so on. That's the apparatus I just went through. Uh, we call all of the output here, we call that local, L. But then we estimate the motion from the reference image to each of the other images, or from each of the other images towards the reference, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> and and they, we, they are being modeled. And then we add the noise, the E. So, the idle description i equals d of l plus e is something I developed uh, <clears throat> to handle peak shifts in, uh, in mass spectrometry at the end of the 80s. And then the, I, I uh, saw that we could do bilinear modeling, PCA, etc., of the displacements as well as the intensity changes around 89. And then we had a number of patents in this, and I worked. Um, uh, for some years on idle-based movie compression. It was very effective, except that we didn't have the com computer power at the time. There were some other problems as well, but at least that was one of the main reasons why in the end we, we forgot about it, did something else. But then back in 2014, when I came to the Department of Engineering Cybernetics, my student, PhD student said that I need to form a company because they saw what this could do. And they said that nobody in cybernetics at least know how to do these things. Okay, so I started this company. <clears throat> so idle is not just that we sit back passively and roll our thumbs, but it is the name of the I equals D of L plus C, which is a way in which there is information both in the abscissa, that's the displacement or address of situations and name of the variables, and the L, which is the ordinate, which is then the, the value of the variables, not the position, but the value. 
So we have this reference image uh, and uh, I should have a single T there. IT equals the displacement of that reference image and its intensity change plus error. So we have, for instance, one image coming in and we estimate the motion estimation from this one, motion field from this one to the reference and we move it, morph it and make that image similar to the reference. And we get a new one. Now we see the mo later on or earlier on, actually, we're, go we're going backwards in time here now because of the fact that the latest frame is the best to use as reference. Uh, we see the motions are different. The shrinkage of the wood is diff pattern is different. And uh, when we go all the way back to the first stage, we see that the, that the, um, that the motion field is very different. Now we can do principal component analysis, let's say of the horizontal motions. And we find two principal components. And you see that it starts here as very wet and then it, it moves very fast towards something. And then all of a sudden it's not doing something else. So it seems to be two distinct phases of motion and shrinkage in the wood. And that I don't think people were, knew about. Then when we looked at the vertical motions, they look rather differently. And we think that it's going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. That's just a translation stage, mechanical problem of not being able to reposition the image in the, exactly the same position between each scan. There were five minutes between each scan. So this is similar to, this is showing what we need very sorely in, in for instance, uh, satellite, repeated satellite visits. I work with, uh, with also with the thermal imaging of the, um, the on the ground from thermal satellites and so on and and uh, we're there for each satellite passage we have to morph the images so that they all the series of re re revisited observations form a little video so a pixel must represent the same piece of land every time and here we see that the motion estimation has compensated for uh, small errors in the way we did that. It, we, it is the same whether we do it in the lab or we do it from a satellite. So now we have had, first of all, a model of the intensity of the physics and chemistry. Here are the physics, here are the chemistry uh, of the known structure, spatial and spectral, and they were temporal as well. And then we afterwards went to the unknown and we got the unknown with components. Uh, we see uh, very clear structures in the free versus bound water region, among other things. So now we have known and unknown components of the intensity and we have horizontal and vertical motions in the, in the um, positioning. Which means that the overall picture uh, of, um, of the modeling is that we have hyperspectral video camera monitoring the, dry, the drying of the wood, to get big data. We model the intensity changes, absorbance changes with known, in terms of known and unexpected unknown spectral features, got out their spatial and temporal vari variations and form, could formulate differential equations, either nonlinear or linear differential equations or partial differential equations to get the space and time, both for the known and the unknown. And then in addition, from, we got the motion fields and we could analyze the patterns in the motion field. So now we are preparing the next uh, round. We are going to work on the free versus bound water. We are going to look at three or four way perfect modeling. Some other colleagues of ours are already looking at perfect two modeling of the hyperspectral kinetics. And we're going to 
do approximation of specular reflectance and so on inside the EMSE paradigm. What we hope to attain is a very flexible and generic uh, modeling tool for hyperspectral images. So in summary, um, I've said that that um, modern multivariate measurements can generate big data, but to use uh, deep learning, ANN, CNN, may be an overkill. You may use it for fun and just to check. And if you don't find anything with an ANN, CNN, deep learning, then you probably don't find anything with the more physical modeling as well. But don't stop at that because black boxes are very dangerous. So the hyperspectral imaging allows us to, for instance, do little things like remove shadows and also, of course, identify different tree types and, and check the water content and health status of the plants and so on. That's well known, has been around since the 70s. But it's still a lot of people don't realize that this works. And I've said that we should practice uh, machine learning with an eye for the physics so that we use our prior knowledge in theory, be it differential equations through meta models, or be it known spectral or physical features or spectral laws via Lambda's law and so on, the theory of specular reflectance and so on. And then we should have a data-driven model, which both should take the intensity variations as well as the motion variations. And then we could, if we want, use machine learning to see if there is something else, something funny more. And then we have an, a, a self-contained uh, auto encoder where we are part, of many, the human is part of the encoding process. We become smarter as scientists. So the idle modeling allows you to do both ordinate modeling and abscissa modeling. The ordinate modeling is what we are used to. You have a spectroscopy, you stand on the floor of the, of the spectrum, or you stand on the floor of the image itself. You literally stand on the wooden floor, you might say, mentally, and you look at the, intent, the absorbance. And that can be a known and unknown phenomena. And you can see that this process starts here and rapidly develops. This is where the free water is evaporating. And then you start evaporating the bound water, which is a much lower process. And you can likewise work to kind of stand on the wall and look at the floor instead. Here we see how the, the pixels or the, or the elements in the wood move. A lot of people get very, very confused when we start modeling both these domains. They want either to have a stable floor or a stable wall, but when both the wall and the floor wobble or become like jello, then they get very, very seasick. But this is a question of eigenvalues of, this is what we have in life. I mean, that the only thing that makes life stable are eigenvalues, big eigenvalues in certain feedback systems. And here we could see that the motions follow pretty much the same patterns as the, uh, as the uh, optical signals, at least in the horizontal direction across the, the wood, the patterns in the wood, but alongside the patterns of the wood, we saw problems and corrected automatically for problems in the measurement technology as such. We can do both. So the measurement technology here uh, was the translation stage. We couldn't, we couldn't, we never managed to get back to the exactly the same position to look at the date, look at to take pictures in the uh, the position position domain. Likewise, uh, shadows would be that if you take images of the same scene under different uh, um, light conditions, the world look very different. But the world hasn't changed. It's just that the light, the light conditions have changed, the shadows have changed. So deshadowing belongs to this upper part 
and this motion compensation to make sure that the instrument goes back to the same reference and measure the same thing is in the in the motion domain. So what I've done now is to try to show how we, at least in Trondheim, develop a two-way bridge between the house of math and house of everything else <clears throat> through the use of interpretive machine learning with an eye for the physics. That's where the mechanistic model comes in. So we do not want to go to only mechanistic modeling of the known, because that would be very arrogant because our theory is not good enough. So there will be huge um, uh, residuals, unmodeled residuals. But on the other hand, so the purely deductive way of thinking is not enough, but that doesn't mean that it is useless to use deduction. Then the mechanistic, this, the empirical modeling of the residuals as a purely the inductive methods, it is arrogant to think that you sh should just throw a, a neural net on data and think that your empirical data covers everything because from a sampling point of view, that's very difficult to pick up all the information that you need to pick up and that can be picked up by the mechanistic modeling here. So by combining deduction and induction in an abduction as it is called, you get the better of the two worlds. So what I've done is I've gone through the modeling of known phenomena in the sense of simplifying measurements as deshadowing and to separate physics and chemistry in wheat flour and in wood uh, to simplify the, the linearize and simplify the modeling with PLS afterwards, el essentially eliminating the need for PLS regression in simple systems at least because it become, the solution becomes so obvious. And then modeling of unknown phenomena, that is the autoencoding for interpretable data compression, PCA, PLSR, ICA, whatever, but on the residuals after the known phenomena have been taken away, not on the raw data. And then I've advocated that you once you have empirical data and a subspace of those with some salient principal components or PLS components or ICA components or whatever, then you should try to develop mechanistic models and push this information back up here. You don't prove anything down here, but is you generate hypothesis that needs to be scrutinized up here. But once you have them as knowledge, life becomes so much easier and cheaper and more robust. And I use that as an example, particularly hyperspectral video of drying wood, where we used a hybrid model of known unknown variations of the absorbance. And then we did an idle model of motions and light, cha light changes at the same time, the abscissa and the ornament. So together that represents an interpretable machine learning with an eye for the physics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harold. Um, and I can see people are saying thanks as well here. Uh, yeah. uh, let, let me ask if uh, anyone has questions. I already have uh, a few questions. Um, so maybe I can start with one of those. Um, so there was a question about whether you can tell a little bit about modeling the knowns. Uh, so the pure, the kind of the spectra you had of uh, at one stage of brown and water. Uh, can you tell something about how that is obtained? Is it like a spectra of pure uh, compounds or is it uh, like curve resolution or? So the in EMSC, uh, you know, MSC was developed uh, in parallel to the SM, SMB, is that what you SMB, said? SMB, yeah. No. So in either case, you have Bill Lambert's law saying that there are additive and multiplicative things to be corrected. Carl Norris, the grand old man of NIR spectroscopy, when I visited his lab in the early 80s, Lars Munk sent me there, which I'm very, very grateful for. And like Carl Norris, what he was doing is was first to make an additive uh, set or an additive transform that is the second derivative of spectra. That's a purely additive transformation. Then he interactively looked for ratios between two different such uh, derivatives. So it had a multiplicative aspect, multiplicative aspect in the ratioing and an additive aspect both in the numerator and the denominator. Um, so it was 
and and I was, he was and that worked very beautifully. But of course, he had 30 years of experience in sitting and looking at these things. I had no clue what what was going going at the different wavelengths. But more basically, I had only 19 wavelengths. So and he had a scanning instrument. So MSC was developed as a, I, I want you know I'm not very happy with transformations that are not giving me interpretable parameters. I want a model. I don't want a filter. I don't want to get rid of things. I want just to separate different types of information. Because sometimes the light scattering variation is, the, is more important than the absorbance. But I want to separate physics and chemistry because they just interfere with each other because they are not additive. <coughs> Lambda's law is multiplicative and Beer's law is additive. So that said, the, we build up a linear model in EMSC with spectroscopy, with a mean spectrum to catch the overall um, optical path length, and then some chemical spectra. But now it's the answer to the question. The chemical spectra that kind of pads the modeling so that if there are very strong, um, if there are very strong chemical variations, these chemical variations in the data do not destroy the estimation of the physical parameters. So we kind of, the, what you need is not the perfect, not the perfect uh, spectral, let's say water spectrum. We use a, a, a tap water spectrum, although we know that water in wood doesn't look like tap water, but it is much better than not having anything. So from an EMSC point of view, um, you don't need a perfect set of of pure component spectrum. There are, you know, any trick in the book is allowed there because all you do is just to make sure that you don't throw the baby out with the wash water. Yeah. But when you then go on and try to make a mechanistic, more semi-mechanistic model, like we are now trying to do with the water in wood, we have to distinguish between free and bound water because they are so different in spectrum. Yeah. So they are, we are working both in linear and sphere. And in both cases, there is a shift between free and bound water, no matter which of the, of the water peaks you are looking at. There's so many different ranges you can measure water. So the answer is that um, you kind of, you, you, can, you can get away with very dirty, approximate or even erroneous chemical models of spectroscopy in the, in the EMSC. But if you go on with only that, and then you start analyzing the residuals and the real world data don't agree with your simplification, then uh, shit hits the fan because then you have, then the, the EMSC or the PCA of the residuals will have to pick up and model that error that you did. But that's very easy actually. So in the, the answer in the end is that life is not as hard as it looks. The hard part for most chemists is that we, like at least I did, I hated mathematics. Yeah, true. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, there's another question in the chat. How was the mechanistic model formed at the later stages once the residual analysis was done? Well, in the case of the wheat flour, when we had these straight lines, five straight lines that ended up in a one point with a flat baseline, we had to, you know, juggle back and forth and start writing a mechanistic model based on Bayer Lambert's law that had, at some stage, had, um, had a, a flat baseline. What would that be? And that would probably be extremely high light scattering so that the photons never had a chance to meet any proteins or starch molecules. So they were just little mirrors that sent it back out. And so we, and then by increasing the optical path length, the, 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 uh, the photons would dig deeper and deeper and deeper into the flower before it kept coming back out. And it's the same as having a, a white wine glass. Those of you who have had the bad thing of re, drinking red wine out of a white cocktail glass, a triangular cocktail glass, you know that at the bottom of the cocktail glass, the uh, optical path length is short. So there it looks like uh, just water. And at the top, you don't see anything through because the path length is long. And that's precisely what you also get 
with increasing light scattering. Because with light scattering and reflectance, the more light scattering you have, the more of the photons coming back have only been scratching the surface and have very little probability of having been absorbed by, by the molecular vibrations chemistry. So in that case, at least the mechanistic model was developed by trying to, what I did at least, I, I always try to ask myself, how does it feel to be a photon? How does it feel? What I, if I were a photon, what, what would I meet on my way through this damn powder sample? Yeah, exactly. I like that. Uh, I had a question as well. The OEMSC looks interesting and forgive my ignorance, but I, I wasn't aware of this. Is it really able to sort of separate chemistry and physics? No, I, I, don't, I, I don't, don't know. But what it is, is it is able to develop, extend an EMSC model, extend an extended MSC model, with one or more components, and the process is very easy. It's been, it's, it's really, it's described in a, in a paper in 2011 in Chemolab on the informative paradox, <clears throat> informative converse paradox. The point is that you do a PCA of the raw data, and if there are things that you have not included in the in an EMSC model that you later plan to use if those omissions are so small they have no consequences then why bother but if they are so big that they will have consequences then their spectral effects will have a load will be among the let's say the 10 first loadings somewhere in that 10 dimensional subspace is there a direction that contains uh, that represents a, a, a spectrum that if you include that in the EMSC model, everything would be much easier, more, more easily modeled. And so I put up a criterion. In this case, I had a classical multivariate calibration. I use with a protein content being Y and my EMSC treated spectrum being X. And then the EMSC model had one linear combination of the original PCAs. So there were 10 unknowns. And then I used uh, leverage corrected PCR because that's then I didn't have to do the cross validation. So uh, for, for there are other reasons as well, right? For that, I, I usually I like PLS better, but for this purpose, PCR is okay. And leverage correction allowed me to, to replace principal uh, 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 cross validation. So it works much faster. So I then could estimate RMSCP for protein content, and I just use the simplex optimization FMNS in MATLAB, for instance, to minimize the RMSCP. And in case, in other cases where you, if you want to do classification, you use some kind of entropy measure or whatever, you have to put up a criterion that you want to minimize, and then you just uh, throw the um, simplex optimization. So throw that at the simplest optimization and let the simplest optimization uh, find spectra. Yeah, find the balance. So, so. And you can use then that to, opt to optimize the mean spectrum or to optimize the bad spectra which you want to get rid of or the good spectra that you want to maintain but just pad so that it doesn't destroy the, this physics modeling. Interesting, I like that. Uh, I have to look that up, I didn't know. Uh, 